Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the regular and last committee meeting of the year for the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee. Today is November 27th and I've been joined by Council Members Fletcher, Ellison and Cunningham and I believe a few others will join us shortly. Uh, we'll start with the most major item on our agenda today which is our employment and training partners of the year and so I'd like to ask uh, our amazing staff Deb Helgen to come up and then I'm wondering okay you're gonna do it I thought maybe we'd have a mic but apparently not so go ahead great Thank you so much for having us. Yes, we have a room full of people here to celebrate today. So thank you for taking the time. Each year, the City of Minneapolis Employment and Training and the Minneapolis Workforce Development Board have the great honor of presenting a Partner of the Year Award to, to agencies that provide outstanding employment and training services to unemployed and underemployed adults and youth. Um, I'm always so impressed by the work of the two agencies that are receiving awards today. Both Project for Pride and Living and Minneapolis Urban League provide exceptional services and excellent results for Minneapolis residents. Um, I believe we'll start with the Minneapolis Urban League, whom we've had a, large, a long, long history with. Um, actually, the first record of awards um, that we've um, with the Minneapolis Urban League that we have on record was 1985. So wow. it's a long relationship, um, and I'm calling up right now to present the awards, Laura Beeth. Laura is chair of the Minneapolis Workforce Development Board. She's also chair of the Governor's Workforce Development Board and vice chair of the National Governors Association. So it's one of the few leadership roles she plays in addition her day job is she's the vice president of acquisition of Fairview Health Services. Um, Fairview is such a leader on workforce development on so many fronts and so and much of it is really because of Laura's leadership So we're happy to have her. Um, I'll turn it over so to Laura. Laura. I have a microphone if you wouldn't mind just walking around and then you can face the audience sure. And you can turn your backs to us. That would be good <laughs> Got it Thank you all. Uh, Let's you check the bottom for this Sorry, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, there perfect. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Us. Thank you, Chair Goodman. First of all, um, again, I'm very happy to be here. This is one of the exciting parts of our time here when we get to actually celebrate our great partners. And Deb, again, is the best partner. I have to say to the city, I, I'm on a lot of committees. I'm probably on 12 boards, and the city of Minneapolis team is the best I've ever had. And that's what Deb's leadership, David Frank is here. I know Mark Brenda is not here today, but just the best. And so partners are so important to us. And we all know that you know, we have a talent shortage and we have to do everything we can to get underemployed people into the workforce system, whether they're second career changers or youth. And so our two partners that we're going to recognize have just really excelled this past year. The first one is the Minneapolis Urban League. They are getting the 2018 Adult Service Partner of the Year. As you heard from Deb, they have a long history and footprint in North Minneapolis and being a community partner with the city of Minneapolis. And that relationship has stemmed to really help prepare and support Minneapolis residents for careers. Last year, the Minneapolis Urban League was one of the few agencies that earned additional funding as they exceeded their job placement and retention goals and retention numbers to continue to be stronger each and every quarter of the year. Minneapolis Urban League targets services to a population that are the most challenging to barriers to employment. 98% of their incoming participants are unemployed. Nearly all need to improve basic skills to prepare for employment, and 25% have a criminal history, and 14% don't have a high school diploma. So they're just doing amazing work to help and really service um, their um, clients and working with us as partners. Minneapolis Urban League offers a wide variety of training and support to prepare participants for employment and job retention. Job search strategies and support are blended with interviewing and soft skills, which again, those are keys to success. In addition, participants learn wealth development and financial management strategies that can assist them as they enter employment. In the last year, Minneapolis Urban League launched the Urban Tech Program designed to provide partnerships and participants with in-demand IT skills that would prepare them for the entry into the Metro's booming tech job market. Again, amazing and upfront and really working ahead to meet our talent needs in the city. 
Thank you for your excellent service to low-income Minneapolis residents. I'd like to now call up Steve Belton, Executive Director of the Minneapolis Urban League, to say a few words and to also bring up his team. Want to come around? The cameras will catch you better, Mr. Belton, if you stand on this side. Yeah, come on. <laughs> And, and first of all, I just I really want to thank you for being here personally today. Um, yeah. in, in addition to being a civil rights leader in the community, your presence here means a lot to everybody because they know that you think what they're all doing is so important. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see if you So thank you. Um, I get the, um, it's my pleasure to be here, but it's, uh, I'm standing representing a group of people, amazing people who I will introduce in a moment. Um, but I get to be the, uh, I guess I'm the, um, I guess I'm the eye candy here, uh, Councilman. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, I know. We had to reach way to the bottom of the jar to get this particular piece of eye candy, but that's my job here is to be the spokesperson and to accept this award on behalf of the Urban League. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, we uh, have a terrific partnership with the city, with Deb, and with really with the Minneapolis Employment and Training and the Minneapolis Workforce uh, Development Board. Uh, it's been a strong and a fruitful partnership. I didn't know that it goes back to, um, uh, what was it, 19, 1985. I was um, a mere 50 years old at that point in time, so <laughs> um, I didn't know it went back that far, but it's been a very enjoyable and fruitful partnership. Uh, and through this partnership, we're able to provide comprehensive employment services that are tailored to each client's needs. In fact, it's that flexibility, the ability to tailor our services to the client rather than a one-size-fits-all approach that really distinguishes our program, but just as importantly distinguishes the city of Minneapolis in employment and training and their willingness to partner with a community-based organization that wants to be able to do what's best for its clients, not what's best for the metrics uh, of the day. And we accomplish this by rigorous assessment of our clients. Uh, we do inventories in particular, they do, each client com, uh, completes what's called the Holland and the Truity online interest inventories, which are tools that help our clients focus in on what it is that they really want to do. So many of our clients come to us, as you can imagine, long-term unemployed, some of them having been about a quarter of them previously incarcerated. They don't really know for sure what they want to do. They're really clear about what they don't want to do. They don't want to work for jobs in jobs that are not going to pay them a family sustaining wage. They don't want to work in jobs that don't have benefits. They don't want odd hours or just doing pickup kind of work. But they don't necessarily know exactly what they do want to do. And so the assessment tools that our staff provides help them focus in on that. We use these assessment tools to help our clients determine what their focus areas are and to tailor services to meet their specific needs. And then we follow it up um, that those uh, assessments with rigorous one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching where we establish long-term trusting relationships with these people. Now let me give you some quick examples of some successes we had in the past contract year. Uh, Danny, um, who we placed as a union laborer at refractory service earning $31.65 an hour. Um, Col Colicia, excuse me, a union carpenter we placed at Baxter and Stuns, earning $22 an hour. And then it was Charles, who is earning right now $25.83 an hour, <coughs> excuse me, as a laborer at Ames Construction. We placed Angelo as a roofer for North Tech, earning $19.30 an hour. And we have with us today Dexter Crockett, who we placed at TCR as a machine operator at $15 an hour. Dexter, would you stand up and be recognized? <laughs> so let me get to the heart of this and then I'm going to take my seat. Let me introduce to you to the amazing staff we have who work on this uh, work in partnership with the city of Minneapolis. So Hillary Thomas, uh, Deborah Young, Norma Miller, and Barbara Doyle. Uh, Barbara Doyle is our workforce manager and Hillary Thomas and Excuse me. And uh, Norma and Deborah are both all job developers. Would you all stand and be recognized yeah, as well? <laughs> These are 
terrific dedicated staff and all of them are under the leadership of Nicholas Yeager, who is our Director of Workforce and Wealth Accumulation. Nick, stand and be recognized. So, Council Members, the, this is the brains behind the outfit. These are not only the brains, but the brawn. They put in the work, they have the vision, and they carry it out, and they are dedicated working on behalf of the citizens of Minneapolis. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Belton, for being here today. And thank you for your, to your entire team. It's an honor to be here and hear all the results as well. So thank you so much. Our next award will be the 2018 Youth Service Partner of the Year Award. This will be for Project for Pride and Living. Project for Pride and Living has a long history of providing housing and employment services in Minneapolis. PPL, other, otherwise known as, has partnered with the City of Minneapolis on the Step Up program since 2008. A bit about the success this year. Over the past year, the City of Minneapolis has collaborated closely with Project for Pride and Living to realign the Step Up Work Readiness training curriculum to correspond with the Minneapolis Public School Career Readiness Seminar course. I'm sure this was no easy feat. This is like <laughs> challenging to do and something that we really wanted to see completed. Step Up students 16 years of age and older in high school earn the half credit for the course through Project for Pride and Living's Loring Nicollet Alternative School an MPS contract alternative school. The pioneering approach allows step-up interns the option to earn high school credit for their work experience on the job. Step-up, or otherwise, once they earn this prerequisite credit, this integration fosters a deeper connection between how an intern's work experience connects to the individual's education. So key. This Inaugural year was extremely successful, and Step Up plans to build on this for the 2019 year, including differentiated curriculum and the opportunity for interns to earn work experience credits. The PPL team, led by Amy Anloff and Christy Snyder, were vital to the success of the curriculum alignment with the Minneapolis Public School Career Readiness Seminar. They trained teachers to deliver curriculum and oversaw a process of curriculum delivery to meet all Minnesota Department of Education regulation for students to earn credit. In addition to this credit, in 2018, PPL managed the step up training for eighth graders as well. The professional development day for all level one interns during the summer and led the pre-employment training for level two interns interested in internships in healthcare. What I'd like to also add is, I personally have had the pleasure to work with Project for Pride and Living, and they have really stepped up every step of the way. We have been partnering with them on their underemployed um, individuals to look at apprenticeship programs, and they are there working with us on that curriculum as well, and it's so important. Um, Paul Williams, their CEO, was here earlier, and he was so excited and thankful for this opportunity, but he did have to leave, and he sends his thanks. He had to leave to chair a meeting, so I'm going to call up Christy Snyder, his LEAP director, to say a few words and accept the award. Welcome, Christy. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm not the eye candy. I'm more like the energizer bunny uh, behind some of this work. And so we are very grateful for this opportunity to work with the outstanding City of Minneapolis Step Up team to really think big, um, dream bigger, and really make sure that we're doing right by young people so that more young people than ever can participate in Step Up so they don't have to make the choice between summer school and have a really meaningful Step Up internship. And up, I brought Key with me, and she was a Step Up intern and is part of the PPL family, so I was gonna let her say a couple words um, because all of youth voice is critical in this work and we appreciate that. Hi, my name is Key Rose. Um, I'm not sure. I've been in Step Up for four years and I absolutely love it. And it's been definitely a great experience for me when I first moved to Minneapolis. Um, my mom brought it to me and was like, this is like, this sounds amazing. And you get work credit, I mean, sorry, school credit and um, get paid for it. And so I jumped into it and I've been a part of it for four years and I've known Anna Peterson um, for four amazing years and I am just really happy to be a part of the Step Up and PPL family. Um, so this team, we wouldn't really be able to do it without Anna and Nina and Teresa joining the team. And we are just so 
pleased that we get to have such partners from the city of Minneapolis that are so innovative and really will push the envelope. So we did have 352 young people earn high school credit this summer in our first pilot, which is amazing. Um, and I forgot Jeremy too. Hi, Jeremy. You're really important too. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I want to make sure that the city of Minneapolis knows how important that team is. And then our own PPL team, like Angie and Lindsay, have been doing this step up work with the middle school students for a long time. For, since 2008 and then Amy's leadership is absolutely critical in doing all of the behind the scenes that makes that credit possible um, so I just want to say thank you we look forward to um, future work with the step up team in the city of Minneapolis and we appreciate all that is able to happen so thank you thank you again to both project for pride and living and for the Minneapolis Urban League they're both an inspiration and we're so privileged to work with you Thank, Thank you for Thank taking you so the time much. today. Okay. So we are gonna move on with our agenda. I know you all find it very interesting. Um, we're going to issue a number of licenses today for new businesses, so if you'd like to stay and hear about the new businesses, you're welcome to do so, but if you don't want to, we will not be insulted if you leave now. <laughs> and we'll give you a chance to do that. Did they call? Not yet. Okay. Um, I just want to note then that we'll uh, move on with our regular agenda. And I'd like to move the consent agenda, which is items 9 through 14. This includes the liquor license approvals, the business license approvals, the gambling license renewals, business license operating conditions for a business at 2841 Hennepin Avenue. Uh, as well as license settlement recommendations for the loop at 606 Washington Avenue North, and lastly, um, authorizing a data sharing agreement at no cost with the Minneapolis Public Schools that would enable step up participants to earn academic credit for their training and work experience. So that is the consent agenda. I will move all items. Are there any other comments or questions on those items? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Those items are approved. We'll then move to our public hearing agenda, starting with item number two, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item number two is for WCH Food Halls, Inc., doing business as Bus Stop Brew House. It's located at 600 South 4th Street, Suite 130. It, their application that they're making is for an on-sale liquor license, Class E, with Sunday sales and that um, as it translates into the next year when we have a new classification of entertainment will be for um, no entertainment. This business will operate as a full service restaurant with 114 seats inside and 14 seats outside. It, the hours will be 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Wednesday uh, and 11 to 12 a.m. Um, on Thursdays interior and the exterior will um, only operate until 1 a.m. Um, again, I said this will be a, a, an establishment that will be a full service restaurant with um, entertainment that would be considered no entertainment, which is just background music. And um, because it's a new establishment, we require a public hearing. Notices were sent to property owners within 450 feet of the premises. We received one response in support. Um, after reviewing the application for all minimum requirements, Lead Inspector Christina Seaster is making a recommendation to approve at this time. Are there any questions for staff on item number two? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number two, which is an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales for Bus Stop Brew House. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Is there anyone here from Bus Stop Brew House? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Fletcher. Uh, I'll move approval. Approval of item number two has been moved. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number three, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item number three is for Any Palace, Inc., doing business as Any Palace. It's located at 2500 4th Street Northeast in Northeast Minneapolis. The current license that they hold is for an on-sale liquor license, Class E, with Sunday sales, which is an, a no entertainment license. They're making an upgrade um, request to be Class B, which would be a uh, general entertainment category, which would include dancing and all levels of, of entertainment with musicians. Um, it should be noted that part of our um, work in business licensing to know that this need was there was that we did um, understand that um, there was a gap in how they were offering services and uh, the license that they had. And the licensee worked with us to make the application for the upgrade. In the meantime of making application for the upgrade has had four temporaries. Um, and uh, those temporaries were conducted recently in November with um, some conditions on how they'd operate. Um, with this application and the upgrade, there's a public hearing requirement. Notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises. We did receive five responses in um, opposition and had concern about noise and late hours and negative behaviors as people were leaving the premises. Not so much the noise that's happening on the premises, but as they leave the premises. Um, so uh, our work uh, to negotiate some conditions that um, address those concern and uh, to use the temporary licensing process as an opportunity to do a uh, kind of a test pilot to see if that's working, um, feels that it is working. The licensee is here and has uh, agreed to these conditions and also to see if there's any additional ones from the public hearing and those would be um, enforced on them. Um, uh, I have no other questions. We are making a recommendation to make uh, um, uh, a recommendation to approve this license. It was Julie Casey, our lead inspector, who's doing that recommendation. Are there any questions for Ms. Roberts on item number three? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number three, which is an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales class B license at 2500 4th Street Northeast. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take anyone who would like to speak. You can just line up if you would give your name and address for the record. Starting with whoever would like to speak first. Uh, who are the people who are here asking for the application? Why don't you guys speak first? Yep. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Todd Wojak. I've owned the Northeast Palace for 15 years. And uh, recently we decided that we wanted to uh, expand our business to have uh, live music. Um, so upgrade the, the liquor license. So I was in contact um, with uh, Julie Casey. Uh, great experience with her. I couldn't thank her for uh, showing me how to do this, um, outlining the process and whatnot. Uh, we worked with um, crime prevent specialist Ali Rashid as well to help us put a, a good game plan together to um, monitor the neighborhood and um, make sure that um, there's not going to be any other issues. Um, and also um, Officer uh, Todd Loining as well. Um, just, uh, it was a great experience working with all these people here. And um, we just want to, instead of getting all the temporary license for the music, we want to, um, I think it's a class B license, yeah. Okay, so perhaps you, I've received a good amount of email from the clerk about this. So it sounds like this temporary thing hasn't worked so well. <laughs> so I've, maybe well, you what, what do you mean? I, I don't know about that. I mean, the feedback we're getting is that there are a lot of people spilling out into the neighborhood. There's a lot of noise. There hadn't been that kind of noise or disruption prior to the live music. Now there is. Are you unaware of this? Uh, I'm very unaware of that uh, okay. because we, we've been monitoring. We, we have a uh, security that goes down um, a, 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 almost a block away 
to make sure that there's no noise going outside, which, I mean, we have a new door and it's pretty much uh, impossible for that. The only noise that it could be would be people, you know, uh, on the street or whatever, and we're, we're monitoring that and trying to reduce that noise as okay. well. Um, okay, well, we'll see what all the people that came down to testify have to say, but I have a feeling you might be asked to address that further during okay. the public hearing. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Maybe everyone says, give them the license, this is great. I guess we'll have to see what everyone says, but I'm just going by what I saw in the email. Right, I understand, uh, but we do have a new plan to to cut down or virtually eliminate all that. Okay. Which was the one where we were monitoring, uh, going, down the, going down the block um, every 45 minutes or so, making sure that everybody leaves in a timely fashion. Okay. All right, why don't you have a seat and we'll see why all of these people came. It would be unusual to have a lot of people come to speak to a license, so we'll hear what happens next. Uh, okay, anyone, raise your hand if you're here to speak. Everyone line up. Please give me your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Margie Siegel. I live at 2514 4th Street Northeast, so we're three doors north of the palace. We've owned our house since 1997, so previous bar owners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I know that many of our neighbors have uh, relayed their concerns to Inspector Casey, and I just want to note that I know of at least two residents who were unwilling to share their complaints because they were worried about retaliation. Um, through. Throughout 20, the end of 2016, all the way through 2017 and through 2018, the residents on our block regularly experienced major disturbance from Northeast Palace patrons, including noise late into the night, garbage left in our yards, uh, black driveways, which uh, the street where we are has driveways that alongside each house. We don't have, we have an alley, but no, doesn't really work that way, just the way that the zoning and uh, blocking out happened. Everybody's got their own driveway and the, our driveways are often blocked. Bar customers are out on the street, um, especially after the bar closed, hollering at each other, playing loud thumping music while parked in front of our homes, loud, drunken, crying, laughing, peeing, and vomiting in our yards, um, and more. No resident of our block was um, protected from this activity. We all sleep now with our windows closed all summer long because of the bar noise. And that's a huge quality of life issue. I mean, I don't know if any of you sleep with your windows closed all night, all summer, but it's crazy, <laughs> a crazy way to live. The, I know this bar is working on a security plan. Uh, Inspector Casey shared that with us. Um, and it looks really good. It's words on paper. We don't have a lot, I don't have a lot of experience trusting these bar owners. They've not participated in any block events, although they've been invited every year. They've given us many reasons to see that we have opposing goals. They've repeatedly said, what do you expect? You live near a bar. This, is, this just comes with, with your world, although it didn't pre with the previous bar owners. Um, they had tenants living in the second floor space, unlicensed, unpermitted. They've held most of their music. I, I don't understand Todd saying that they'd recently decided to hold music events or upgrade here because all of 2017 they had really, um, a, a, I, don't, I don't know how many nights in a Facebook page broadcasting the music events, a lot of activity around the music events there. So this idea of recently decided, again, is part of not, contributes to my not really trusting, trusting their story. Um, the music last summer attracted a really, really rough crowd at our national night out event in 2017. One of the city patrol officers came by, a couple did, came by for a hot dog, just the way they do. And one of the officers, when I started asking about the bar and activity, he said he wouldn't do off-duty work there anymore. The crowd was too unruly and obnoxious. And to hear that from an officer saying, I'm not, I'm not going to tussle with that group, you know, go, you, <laughs> uh, left us hanging, you know, okay, so we're just, what are we supposed to do here besides call 911, 911, 911? So it's really hard to trust the owners. Um, at this point, the security plan, it's just words on paper and really not worth much more than that to me. I, I hope it's enforced. I, it feels like from ins the communications with Inspector Casey that this is, it's not a done deal. It's the city wants to 
give this, uh, allow this permit to allow this license to go through with certain conditions. So I can only hope that the conditions are enforced. They look fairly robust. Uh, kind of kind of wait and see here. And if the plan's not adhered to, I'd expect the city to enforce and, and penalize. Thank you. For Thanks your again for the opportunity to speak. Okay. We're, I'm going to try to ask you to keep your comments to two minutes if you can. Who's next? You can simply raise your hand if you agree with the person who just spoke. You do not have to speak, but you're welcome to. Does this work? It does. It's going to take the, see, look at that. Okay. Great. Oh, I, I, okay. That, that's good enough. I, 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 I or do you, do you, it, don't touch it. They'll, they'll, oh, it'll, it'll focus. Yep. It's focused. Okay. We can see it. Okay. Really um, th that was my wife and co block club leader, uh, Margie Siegel. Um, I'm Scott Horn, uh, 2514 Northeast fourth street. Um, and my statement is, is a little bit different from hers, um, and, but I do not disagree with, with one word uh, she said. Um, I have uh, three quick items. First, Northeast Palace 911 calls have noticeably decreased or changed or changed for the better. They were really icky in 2016 and 2017. The, the 911 calls in 2016 and 2017 were really icky. They have improved. 311 provides instructions on how to obtain 911 call lists. Second, owner Molly and Inspector Casey have openly put their emails out into our neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, and asked for our concerns. They have received lots of feedback. There have been dozens, <clears throat> there have been dozens if not scores of emails, none of them cruel and most, if not all, helpful. I think if owner Todd decides to put his email address into our neighborhood, that would be seen as a nice gesture from him. Thirdly, being a neighborhood bar open until 2 a.m. should be an earned privilege. But I think while you, the city, are strict with residents or individuals, you are not strict with our neighborhood bar. You are right to be strict with building permits for homeowners. Without shaking. You are right to be strict with us about building permits for us. You're also strict with animal owners. Scary strict, I would say. This here says valid hen permit is, not having a valid hen permit is $50, and the fine can double daily. I've felt your warnings multiple times as a homeowner. Bar owner Molly told me last Tuesday she can't recall any citations or fines that the bar ever got. Here's, excuse me. In a simple way, this sheet, this is a 311 sheet, also illustrates that you are not strict with our bar. There's a couple 311, there's noise pollution uh, in April of 17, and again, noise pollution another date in April 17. That was a problem description. The status on both of them, no violation, no violation. To consider all the years of 911 calls and outrageous 
disruptions with no apparent discipline from you, that boggles the mind. Is anyone else here who would like to speak? I, I don't have a lot to say. My name is Chris Schlichting. I live at 2545 4th Street, Northeast, uh, kind of the end of the block. And I think they've really articulated, I think Margie in particular, uh, just the the lack of kind of care for the neighborhood and consideration and re lack of response. Um, to, it seems disingenuous to say that you, uh, this is the first you've heard of th this situation because it's been constant. I mean, every night of the week, um, Sunday nights, you know, I work during the week, 8 a.m. to 4.30. Um, you know, that 2, two o'clock bar time close, there's just constant um, hanging out in the street, disruptions at night. Um, it's just really difficult. Quality of life is just dramatically altered in, in recent years since the entertainment. That it's just really difficult to get an evening's night sleep. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, just the screaming, the crying, um, used condoms being found in our yards. Um, yeah, it, it uh, is appalling and uh, disruptive. Um, and then to hear also that the that just the lack of sort of willingness to work with the neighborhood or sort of an interest in, a general interest in um, our concerns. Uh, I was curious at the beginning, you said that you heard from six people um, in terms of a negative response. I, I wasn't sure that there was, I wasn't aware that there was a way to respond to the, the public hearing, but there's been a chorus in the neighborhood. I mean, I think our, our, our turnout here today is representative of um, the, the, the strength of resentment that has built over the, the number of years that this has been uh, going on. Um, and then I also heard something said about the monitoring having increased or something and how that seems to be working. Could, could someone kind of talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, we'll have staff respond at the end, but I'm okay. writing down your questions. Okay, but uh, just this has been sustained. I think we've just sort of, um, some of us have, you know, we documented for a long time, like when 911 calls were being made, but it's continuous. You know, every single weekend, I can't, I, I don't recall a weekend when there hasn't been disruptive noise, um, and we talk about it. Too, in, in the neighborhood too, so I, I think it's unanimous, the, the feelings across the board. Thank you. Is there Thanks. anyone else here who would like to testify? Okay, come on up, state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Thomas Johannes. I live at 2541 4th Street Northeast. Um, a lot of this stuff, you know, with this music and everything that would happen, we have a lot of working people in the neighborhood and a lot of children. And they have that that loud stuff going on at two o'clock in the morning plus wouldn't do very good for their schooling and for the people that have to go to work and I mean this isn't this isn't light noise this is loud very loud and uh, I've called many times and you can't blame the the police I mean by the time they get there or they see them coming you know they'll they'll disperse but it happens. You just look outside, and you'll you'll see uh, bottles every every week. You're picking up bottles out out of our uh, boulevard, you know, beer bottles and stuff. And they uh, go out, they'll sit, uh, they'll pull a beer out or drinks and turn the music on in the in the vehicle. You go out and dance in the street. I mean, this is constant. This isn't just a one-time deal. Don't like it, and it's happened. Lots and lots and lots of times. Thank you for being here today and for You're your welcome. testimony. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Ms. Roberts, do they have a license to have live music now? Thank you, Madam Chair. Right now, their license is for a classy license. They do not. They've had a um, temporary applications that they've submitted in the time that we found that they were in violation. They were advertising for um, um, 
entertainment that was outside of their class. So they did get violation notices. I understand that some of the testimony was that, um, you know, what kind of uh, enforcement action have we taken on the licensee? We've sent them notices, but that doesn't mean that then we go directly to citations. So um, immediately upon us being aware that there was a gap in the type of license they had and the type of entertainment that they were advertising for, they actively worked with us, submitted an application, ceased operation of their entertainment that was not allowed. And um, it, it, it wasn't a quick time frame. It was about, I think around six months or so that they've been working on a plan to address the um, concerns that people were voicing that are, there's a gap between what we can um, effectively hold a licensee responsible for on their premises and the behavior of their business, um, their customers that um, park maybe a block down and how they make noise a block down. I think um, parts of the conditions, and I can read them, that they've agreed to and have adhered to in, in the last month or so. Um, and, I, and I believe there, there was um, a, a resident that um, provided some testimony to me that he said in the very recent history of the month that um, things have been addressed in a different way. So I wonder if if the folks that have been um, providing testimony, if this is historical information or if they've, they've seen any shift. But some of the things that they've agreed to as a licensee go above and beyond what we can ask licensees to typically do. And that would be um, uh, doing a, um, like a sidewalk patrol, uh, walking um, down the block, ensuring that people are um, exiting at bar close in an orderly fashion. Um, they are also considering trespassing or not allowing um, anyone that is a repeat offender of these types of behavior when they do these patrols, not allowing them to come back to the establishment. So I think the reason why we didn't want to present all of the conditions and put them into law now, we wanted to hear more about what could be done and the licensee is willing to do everything to address those issues, even above and beyond what the ordinance say now, um, to address those issues. When they become a condition on the license, which they do not have conditions right now, but if they were to have these conditions on their license, uh, I have a staff of people, and Julie Casey is a lead, and she's one of my best. They will comply with these conditions. So if it says that they're going to clean up litter and over and beyond even what the requirements are, they will do that. And if they do not, they will get a ticket. And if they do not, they will um, lose the privilege of this um, uh, license to have expanded entertainment and even the license that they have to operate an establishment in the city of Minneapolis. So, but I want to understand this. So they didn't have a license to do what they were doing. So instead we've said, okay, we're going to give you the license to do what you're doing and then we're going to put some conditions on it. On it. Instead of saying, wait a second, you were doing all these things you shouldn't be doing. So we'll reward you and just make it kosher. I don't get that. I mean, we, if this was happening downtown, Councilmember Fletcher and I wouldn't tolerate it. It sounds like you have kind of like this out of control situation going on and instead of saying, shame on you for doing what you shouldn't be doing, you better operate well for six months before we consider an upgrade, we said, go ahead and upgrade the license and make what you're doing legal and then put some conditions on it. Um, how many police calls have there been? I mean, he showed us a list. I, I don't have my computer with me or I would have looked that up immediately. Have there been more than three? Um, Madam Chair, uh, we did do that investigation. We looked at um, how they were operating in the recent history. Those those reports, and I believe that the person that had them, they were from um, years ago. So it wasn't recent activity. And um, I do believe that we do in the city, um, once we make someone uh, aware that they're operating out of compliance, we do give them a path to get into compliance. We didn't jump to um, rectifying this quickly, and they were active in being involved in addressing a solution that was even above and beyond 
what we would require of a Class C license. So if they did not get this upgrade, um, respectfully, if they did not get this upgrade, they still would have the issues that they're having at that establishment because of um, patrons leaving at 2 a.m. It, yeah, not and then directly... they would have their license at stake. Then we would have a license settlement conference on the current license they have. Instead of making what their bad behavior doing illegal, why don't we see if they can operate within their own parameters of their current license for a period of time? Because the next, what we should have done is go after their license for all this bad behavior instead of trying to get them into compliance with the new bad behavior. This is where I may ask um, uh, for legal counsel. Right now, without the conditions that we that they've agreed to to go above and beyond what we can require in ordinance, we would not be able to take any act action against their current license because the things that are concerning to the the neighbors are are things that are happening outside of the premises of the establishment. It's well, behavior that's happening. Whatever, I get that. I don't buy it at all. If they want to have a license in the city, well, these guys, it sounds like these neighbors are just simply going to call the police and call licensing over and over and over again until they get the documentation, until it ends up being enough responses that uh, we will do something about it and we'll go after their current license. If I live next door or on this block, I would be outraged and I can completely relate to what the neighbors are saying. I, maybe I'm the only one. I, I will see what the... People on the block have you, uh, you, 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 I'm sorry. You can't speak out of turn in a public hearing, but I appreciate your passion. As you can see, I share it. Councilmember Allison. Just for clarification, I think uh, earlier it was said that uh, all of the complaints were about behavior outside of the bar, but are there complaints about behaviors inside of the bar um, and on the premises of the bar? To the information that we have, and again, we don't have 311 complaints. I know that they're talking about the 911 complaints, but um, I don't have information about um, concerns that are happening inside the bar. Okay, because uh, I, just because I think that that would kind of clarify whether, you know, like, because if there are, because if to our knowledge there isn't anything happening inside the bar, everything's only happening outside, then I can kind of see some of the, the bureaucratic sort of rigmarole that we're stuck in. But if there are complaints happening on the premises, uh, and maybe the, um, the, we already closed the public hearing. Yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. you guys can't speak to that now. But it sounds like there are, there are complaints about the conduct on the premises as well, and so I, um, so yeah, just wanted to get that clarification though from, from the record. Councilmember Gordon. I wanted a little bit of clarity that we're not approving any conditions right now. At this time, we um, have not finalized the conditions because we wanted to make sure that we were satisfying the issues that the uh, residents had and what was gonna happen from the public hearing. I think it's getting back to the statement of are there concerns about how it's operating inside right now? I, wait, I, 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 I don't know that we have all of the right construct, and I'm open to um, any kind of conditions that we pl place on this business. Thank you. I just wanted that clarity. I, one of the things that we might want to consider doing is moving it forward without recommendation at this point might actually give us an opportunity to see if the ward office involved wants to engage a little more deeply in it, but also to see if we can get conditions that would address the concerns could be agreed to. I'm open to other ideas, but that's one thing that struck me is if it left this committee and we didn't approve it, um, we would have an opportunity to see if we could work anything out or not before the council meeting. I'm not making it right now, but I'm putting that on the table to help us get through this agenda item. Anyone else want to weigh in? Councilmember Fletcher? I guess I do have a question, which is, uh, I mean, I'll say based on the testimony, I'm uh, open to the idea that we should deny this today. And I'm, I'm curious, if we were to deny it, how long would they need to wait before applying again? Um, through the chair, um, Councilmember Fletcher, there isn't any time frame that says that um, they wouldn't be able to apply again. So it doesn't um, uh, have, there's no ordinance that says you have to wait a certain amount of time. Um, they would lose their application fee and have to start over again. Okay. Councilmember Gordon. They would also be able to keep operating as um, all we'd be denying is the entertainment license. So they could still be operating as a bar without any conditions added to them. So that's something to think about too. Um, 
except for the condition of knowing that now the neighbors are on top of it and are going to be directed by our conversation about what to do, which is monitor every last thing. And if they can't behave under their current license, then that will be the next thing that they'll go after. And great uh, um, talking point about how the city council responded when we heard about all the complaints as well and how seriously we took them, particularly the chair of the committee. Mm -hmm. No, I just think it's horrible. And, and in fact, I'm very frustrated that we seem to issue the licenses like candy and then our enforcement's like molasses. So we're just like, have the license, let's see if you can behave. In this case, they actually didn't behave for whatever reason you didn't know, you couldn't have live music, whatever it is. They, they violated the license. They advertised activity that's not in their license. And our reaction to that was, let's get you into compliance. That's what, where I think the sticking point is. I mean, I want us to all think about the fact that this charter amendment just passed, and now all neighborhood restaurants are going to be able to have all kinds of liquor, and some will have music too. And is this what we want the community to think? This is how we're going to react? We're going to give all these licenses out, and then if there's a problem, we're going to say, well, sorry, we can't do much about it? I th I'm just worried about what's going to happen next, and it's not fair to say, well, Northeast is special because they have this kind of history of having these rowdy places. I mean, Northeast, like downtown, is a neighborhood, and the neighbors shouldn't have to tolerate that kind of ongoing behavior. And they also should feel when they come to the city that someone listens to them. Councilmember Gordon. I just wanted to... Um have some uh, maybe some empathy for the position that staffs put in sometimes because and and I mm -hmm. so so I don't want to be too broad and far reaching about all of this because we actually do want some businesses when they're operating out of compliance to have somebody say here's your pathway to being legal and here's how you could actually get it done and I'll demonstrate that and you could apply for a license and see how it goes so I just I, I want to be focused on this particular license and I think that's great um, and I didn't really um, I just want to yes. defend a little bit because I'm sure there's mixed signals getting from policymakers because we talk about businesses we want to have thriving in areas and enterprises and we actually do want staff sometimes to go in and say hey you've got to do this 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 and this and then you can be operating and if you don't you won't so that's I don't want to derail us into a general policy discussion I actually was and I see I've done that I wanted to just bring us back to this particular issue yes I know you do I, I love you for that I'll just point out I can't help it that when these folks apparently like didn't have their hen licensed we sent them a letter saying for every day that you don't you're going to get a fifty dollar increase in your fine and then did you guys license your hen or whatever it was your rooster well, it was a renewal. They were, yeah they were already, so they went and did it <laughs> and we probably would have come after them for god knows how much money if they didn't so i mean is animal control better at managing their licensing than liquor okay now we think Right, okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may, Madam Chair, just one of the things, and I, I, I'm following the discussion, I absolutely respect the, um, your position, and I respect the neighbors and their concern and the time that they took to come down here. That was a reason why we didn't want to formulate the conditions. We wanted to make sure the voice was heard here. One of the things, if the council does go in the direction of denying this license, that um, I did talk to the licensee about the relationship that they need to repair with their neighbors and that they have been complying with these, that we are holding them accountable, although it hasn't gone through that legal process. They understand that we're going to do that in the meantime. So whatever happens today, if this gets approved, denied, or forwarded, they're going to comply with these, and I'm going to hold them to that. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. I think the presence of the neighbors has uh, sort of left an impression on me. We, we've had folks complain about businesses, but the complaints have been pretty light, and they you know, usually get resolved sometimes right here in, uh, in, they in this like room. They don't like the parking. Right, or like that there's, some, there's a little bit of light pollution. Uh, but this is uh, the, the complaints that we've heard from neighbors have been more substantial than that today. Uh, and so for that reason, um, and look, I I'm, I'm uh, you know want to see you guys succeed, but for that reason, I feel like I would go ahead and move to deny the license uh, and and sort of give uh, the business owner and the Q and the uh, uh, community members here on the block uh, some time to solidify that relationship uh, and build a little bit of goodwill so that when you guys reapply um, it's a nor it's a it's a normal situation you come in you know we sort of hear testimony you, you know uh, thanks are given and then everybody goes home uh, but the this isn't this isn't usually how <laughs> these things go and 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 I think that the nature of the complaints from the community uh, have, uh, have have left an impression 
on me, so I, I'm going to make it. Go ahead and make that motion. Okay, so the motion in front of us is to deny the license upgrade. It's not to yank your actual license, just to be clear. So you have an opportunity to continue to work with everybody, should you choose to do so, for six months or three months. It's the winter anyway. Uh, their windows are going to be closed. So perhaps there's a period of time in which you guys can work together to determine how they can get to the point where they can get the correct licensing that they would like. Because we've cut you this break here to have a cooling off period. I will cool off too from this after this meeting. <laughs> um, we never, I have to be honest with you, usually people get up and tell us all the good things they're doing and the neighbors are here saying, yay, a new business in our neighborhood. So, in fact, I encouraged all those kids to sit here and listen to all the licenses <laughs> yeah, they would have gotten quite because that's what happens. Everyone's so excited a new business is getting a license or getting to do something in their neighborhood. I, in all the licenses we do, we rarely see this. So um, I'm supportive of the motion, uh, and I will call the question. All in favor of Councilmember Ellison's motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved, and I would encourage you guys to go out to the hall and talk about how you're going to get to the point where they're all going to come here and say, yes, we like a Class B license. Madam Please Chair. work towards that. I apologize, but I would also additionally request that you direct the City Attorney's Office to prepare findings uh, regarding your denial decision. Um, I would uh, add to Councilmember Ellison's motion to direct staff to prepare findings for the Council meeting a week from Friday. Okay. On to item number four, which is uh, on sale liquor license with Sunday sales. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, item number four is Demi 212 LLC, doing business as Demi 212. It's located at 212 Second Street North, uh, Suite 100. Um, they are making a request for a, an on sale Class E Sunday sale license at a location where there hasn't been a previous license before. Um, Demi will operate as a full service restaurant with 34 seats inside. 30, um, um, 30 of them are 34 seats total. 30 inside, four outside an outdoor patio on private property. They will be operating from 5 uh, p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, this business owner has, um, is expanding his businesses in the city of Minneapolis. They also own The Spoon at 211 North 1st Street. They've operated there since 2014. Um, a public hearing is required for this application. Public hearing notices were sent to 450 um, property owners and residents within 450 feet of the premises, we received one uh, response and support and lead inspector and Christina Cesar is making a recommendation to approve at this time. Are there any questions for staff on item number four? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number four, which is an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales. Class E for Demi at 212 uh, 2nd Street North. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? <laughs> I'm sorry, Gavin. <laughs> Do you dare? <laughs> we know Are we happy? Yeah, no. you're great. Uh, Thank you. For hi, everyone. There. I'm Gavin Kaysen. I'm the owner of Spoon and Stable uh, and soon to be Demi. So I'm just coming here to say thanks to the city of Minneapolis. Uh, specifically, that neighborhood itself for me has been uh, a joy and a privilege to have a business in. Uh, Spoon has done more than what we ever expected. So we hope that Demi does the same. So it thank will. you very much. Thank you so much for running a great operation downtown. Councilmember Fletcher and I love you for that. <laughs> Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Goodman. I am thrilled to move approval. Very excited about this restaurant opening. Further comments and questions on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number five. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Item number five is for Empire Hospitality, LLC. It is Eric the Red. It's located at 601 Chicago Avenue South. The current location of um, or the current license is an on-sale liquor license, Class E. Uh, they are hoping to expand to an on-sale liquor license, Class um, B license with uh, general entertainment that would allow dancing and also to expand um, their premises. The expanded premises would include the parking lot that's adjacent to Eric the Red. The expanded premises will be used primarily for primary or special events. 
events that happen at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Right now, they're doing those events through temporary expansions. The maximum capacity of that um, area is for 500 people standing, and the proposed hours of operation are interior for um, from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. and um, in the exterior from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, there's a public hearing requirement uh, for this, uh, um, both of these upgrades. We've sent them to property owners within 450 feet of the, uh, of the property, and we've received no responses. Are there any questions for Ms. Roberts on item number five? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number five and invite the owner to come up and tell us what he's doing. Can you tell us what you're doing in the Target headquarters, too? Do you have yeah, a restaurant yeah. over there? Yeah. <laughs> Monday, Monday, <laughs> coming, coming. <laughs> you sound like Target. Um, let me explain. My name is Eric Forsberg. I own Eric the Red. Um, and give you a little clarification as to what's going on over here. Um, we, first of all, we've been working with the city over the last year, particularly during Super Bowl, to doing events in the parking lot, um, which add a lot of top end revenue for us. It gives the, the, our, the space is surprisingly not that large. So with the volume of people that come out from those games, it really helps, helps us manage a crowd as well. So, um, but of course, we are limited to 12 uh, temporary permits a year. So at the request of the city. Um, they said maybe we should look to do something that would expand it permanently. This does not mean that we're expanding permanently and putting a patio into our parking lot that's going to be used seven days a week. This is strictly for special events where there's going to be a large volume of people we can handle. Um, we have some restrictions that we, we've worked with Met Council on this as to how we would work through Sack and Lack on this. Um, the main restriction is, of course, are you support of potties? We do that already. Um, packaged goods that we use, which are all recyclable, um, packaged goods, and then the use of porta potties outside will be used for any event that we do, giving the city notification before we host an event outside. Um, and that's, that's about it. But it allows us to do more than 12 events a year when we have 10 home games. It doesn't take very long before you reach that 10 number, so we just want to be in compliance. And you've made a success out of that spot. And so far, so really good. made it a good, yeah, it's Thank amazing. You. Thank um, you. The pre where the previous owners were not able to succeed, you have a knack with that. Well, we have a new stadium, that helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here, Eric. Uh, is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and I will move approval of item number five. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number six, which is the administrative issuance of business licenses. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to give a really brief um, presentation on the ordinances that are before you today. Um, basically, um, since November of 2005, the City Council has given the licensing official the ability to give um, administratively issue licenses to 82 categories that allow us uh, to provide for our customers that have um, non-controversial licenses a um, quick access to uh, opening their businesses once they meet their qualifications and then do not have to go through a licensing process. Process. It was recently that we realized that um, as we had that availability for our um, the first time that we make recommendations on licenses that we didn't have that for our renewals. And so um, we are coming before you and as uh, the author of this amendment uh, hoping that we would be able to also take that action on renewals of licenses. This does not mean that if a business has uh, issues or <coughs> compliance issues or um, are um, in a place where they shouldn't be operating that they um, automatically get that license. There is a process in place for us to take action to deny their renewals. It's just any businesses that are in compliance would be able to be administratively approved and get their licenses in a timely manner. Are there any questions for Ms. Roberts on item number six? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number six, which are changes to our administrative issuance of business licenses. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Ellison. I will, uh, Madam Chair, I will move approval of this item. Approval of item number six has been moved. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Now to the most awaited item of the year, probably after 10 years of efforts or maybe more, Mr. Terrell, please tell us we're about to get going on the expansion of the Capri. Anne would like to retire at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> so would Jim, Madam Chair. No, 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 no. Chair and members of the committee, Jim Terrell, uh, Business Development, CPED. The first item that you have is indeed for PCYC and the Capri Theater. You'll be considering a land sale, term sheet, uh, authorization for a redevelopment contract and other documents, as well as yet one last extension, we certainly hope, uh, to the development time frame for the previous land sales that were approved by the Council. Uh, without going over them at this late uh, junction, you have the previous actions. There's quite a history with this particular uh, property or series of properties, but the previous action outlines that. Most recent one, again, the uh, extension of the development rights um, for the uh, previous parcels that we had uh, sold several years ago. Uh, but this action today is adding the one last parcel that's necessary to uh, finally complete this. By way of background, a number of you are aware uh, Plymouth Christian Youth Center, or PCYC, is the parent company of the Capri Theater, and their plans are to construct a two-story addition to the existing Capri Theater. That particular addition will involve and include a number of things that are highlighted here, um, rehearsal space, dressing rooms, backstage space, second floor art, youth art, and other programming. That other programming includes uh, something that's very exciting, a, a teen tech center funded partially and substantially by our local uh, company, Best Buy. Uh, the um, adding of the 2106 23rd parcel uh, to uh, the three previous parcels that were sold allows this site to be fully developed with a full vision that's grown and, and altered itself over years of, of planning. Uh, the, the entity, PCYC, has made a great deal of progress in fundraising, which, to be candid, is really the reason this has taken a number of years. PCYC has raised over $6.5 million in its multi-year capital campaign, and so we're very excited uh, that we're finally at a point that we can be in front of the committee and thus council to move forward. Uh, we could also mention that there are still some grants pending, and so while we will address the possibility of being back before the committee and the council in the spring, uh, even though the core building is funded, there are some extra improvements, uh, special interior improvements uh, that uh, are not yet funded, but uh, grant uh, activity is still going on. And so we're excited about that and hope that uh, when we are back before the committee in March or that time frame, uh, we, we would have even more exciting news about the fundraising. Uh, one of the reasons that we will have to come back before the committee is highlighted here in the background analysis. Uh, PCYC and the next project that we'll consider will be uh, um, applying for an allocation of new markets tax credits. Uh, they are working with uh, a promoter and several potential allocatees, and they are at or near the top of the list uh, with a number of those allocatees. So we're very optimistic about their ability to uh, get allocation provided the state of Minnesota doesn't get frozen out, as did occur in 2018. Uh, if that allocation is not forthcoming, we may need to be before this uh, committee and the council again uh, to discuss uh, Great Streets Gap financing and or a small amount of HUD Section 108 for this particular project. We do have some recent soil reports that indicate that there will be likely some additional soil correction on one or more of the parcels. And so as we get through that process yet this fall, uh, we'll have a final tally on that. Uh, we do have intention of making application for additional grants uh, for that soil remediation process, uh, but all of that will come together in the spring. PCYC is a worthy organization for our support, 60 plus year history of providing for youth in the community, and uh, the project itself is worthy in the sense that this theater, the Capri, is the only one remaining uh, neighborhood theater of the 13 that once uh, were in the overall area. We're very excited about it. Uh, the uh, arts education, cultural programming provided, uh, the school that they're associated with, uh, the um, support from the neighborhood is outstanding. 
The development is, uh, we believe, at staff level, a gem for North Minneapolis, and we expect that it will spur other development on the Capri block and in North Minneapolis. Uh, staff recommends approval of the land sale, the term sheet, the authorization to enter into a redevelopment contract to extend the development time frame for the previously sold properties. And we do have with us today Anne Long, the Executive Director of uh, PCYC, as well as her colleagues, James Scott and Mark Downey, if you have questions of them. Okay, great. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number seven, which is approving the land sale at 2106 23rd Avenue North, as well as approving the term sheet for the redevelopment contract, authorizing the redevelopment contract, and approving the extension of the development timeline. I will note, as I see Eric Hansen sitting here, that this was something that was going on when you left, and now it's about to be hopefully under construction now that you're back. So it takes, sometimes it takes the best things a little bit more time, um, but that's okay because the city stands by the project. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anne, did you want to say a few words? Just a few. Thank you, council person, all of you, and particularly to you, uh, Chairperson Goodman, for being patient with us. It has taken a long time. It feels like a long time, but we are really close and plan to be great breaking ground this spring. We'll invite all of you and then in 2020 come back and we'll have a grand opening and, and thanks very much not only to, to all of you but also to the staff that we've worked with that have been so very, very helpful to us and of course my colleagues that are here, James Scott and, and Mark Downey. So uh, look forward to more contact in a very positive way and, and thank you again. Thanks, Ann and, and uh, Mark and James. Thank you for sitting through the meeting and being here and all, all the labor of love you've put into making the Capri a real success. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Uh, <clears throat> just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Terrell for all the work that you've done in getting this, uh, uh, seeing this to fruition, um, and all the staff who have, uh, you know, kind of been a part of this long legacy. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, as somebody who grew up uh, 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 doing visual art, but still as an artist in North Minneapolis growing up, um, your reputation, the reputation of PCYC and the reputation of the theater uh, definitely um, uh, uh, is, is, is a good reputation. It's a deep one. It has a long history in North Minneapolis. Um, and to James and Mark, thank you guys for being here and for, uh, and for all the work that you're doing. Uh, I've never had the privilege of being able to teach at PCYC, but I know some folks who, who have, and I feel like a lot of my mentors have gone through, gone through that, that, that space. Uh, and so this is really an incredible um, opportunity for me as you know uh, representing the area in a lot of ways I'm just kind of lucky and, and inheriting all the work of, of uh, many many people who have come before me uh, but I'm uh, happy that you guys are moving forward and I'm happy to move approval of this item approval of item number seven has been moved further comments or questions seeing none all in favor signify by saying aye. aye any opposed that item is approved and for the very last item on today's agenda Mr. Terrell the land sale at 927 West Broadway which we don't think this development Development will take as much time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, that depends on how you define the timeline. It's got a rich history as well. Again, Jim Terrell, um, CPAD Business Development. Uh, this is also a land sale, a request for authorization for redevelopment contract and uh, for term sheet approval to uh, facilitate the sale of uh, three parcels, 927 West Broadway, 1838 DuPont Avenue North, and 1832 DuPont Avenue North to the 927 building LLC. A number of previous actions, uh, including uh, actions in 1976 and 2009 when 927 was actually acquired as a part of um, uh, staving off litigation. You're familiar with the history. We didn't choose to go into the long recap of it in this particular uh, document. We issued an RFP that was for extended terms in January of this year to allow individuals from this community to participate in the RFP process and to give more time. We did receive a number of RFPs. Uh, only two were totally responsive, and of the two, uh, the one that we chose uh, unanimously by our selection committee was uh, the particular one that's in front of you uh, by the 927 Building LLC. They were rewarded, develop, awarded development rights for five parcels, only three of which 
are being recommended for sale at this time. The remaining two uh, we hope can be before the committee again in the future as phase two and phase three of this project. This as phase one with these three parcels will be development of a three-story addition to the current three-story building at 927 West Broadway. Uh, the building will include elevators fully ADA compliant from the lower level to the top level. Uh, the building will be nearly fully occupied by the three partners that are part of the LLC, uh, the J. and Rose Phillips Family Foundation, Tri Construction, and New Rules. As we mentioned before, uh, no action is being taken today on the remaining two parcels, uh, 1828 DuPont Avenue North and 1001 West Broadway, uh, but they will be back, we hope, in the near future with uh, development proposals for those uh, phase one, uh, phase one, and, or phase two and phase three. Uh, the land sale is for a dollar. We had an appraisal done, a certified appraisal done. The, uh, the deferred maintenance, the uh, uninhabitable condition of the second and third floors of 927, and the extreme level of uh, financial commitment to uh, redevelop the project accounted for that. Uh, we do have uh, a participant in this LLC, in the, the uh, Phillips Foundation, uh, that is bringing a strong credit presence and a strong philosophical presence to this project. Uh, you may or may not know the principles of tri construction and new rules. They're both African American owned businesses right in the neighborhood on or near uh, West Broadway. Uh, the Phillips Foundation has as one of their absolute philosophical goals to be uh, part of the financial strength that makes this happen now, but to have these two local businesses eventually buy them out of the project as far as ownership is concerned while still remaining a tenant. They have chosen, they, the foundation, to move their headquarters to this facility and have already made the uh, bold step to refocus their giving exclusively on or almost exclusively on North Minneapolis. Like the previous project, this LLC will compete for New Markets tax credits this coming February. Uh, they are also high on the list of potential allocatees. We've been working closely with our partners like Sunrise and Lisk and others. So we hope to see uh, a measure of allocation for this project as well. Uh, we may have to return for Great Streets uh, Gap and or for uh, 108 in the future if the New Markets tax credit allocation is less than hoped. We do have a sufficient guarantee from a line of credit established by the um, foundation to complete construction uh, if those other uh, sources of funding weren't um, forthcoming. Uh, the terms wouldn't be as ideal, but it allows us to go forward and to feel comfortable as staff that we can make the recommendation and that the development time frames can be met. We're excited about what this project to the eastern end of our activity on West Broadway can do. Uh, staff, as a part of that excitement of eliminating blight and really reinforcing or reintroducing uh, use of a very exciting business, uh, we recommend approval of the land sale, the term sheet, and the authorization to enter into a redevelopment contract. We do have representatives of the LLC here today. Chris Webley is the principal spokesperson from uh, New Rules, uh, Lester Royal from Tri Construction. And so um, with that, uh, they're here to answer any questions that you have, but we recommend approval. Are there any questions for Mr. Chirala on item number eight? Seeing no questions, we'll open the public hearing on item number eight, which is a land sale at 927 West Broadway, 1838 DuPont, and 1832 DuPont Avenue North to the 927 building. And then we'll also um, move forward with the redevelopment contract and related documents as well as the term sheet. So I'd like to welcome Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you guys again for having us. Uh, really, 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 really excited that we're here today. Um, and just on behalf of the partners, I wanted to say thank you guys again. Um, again, the part of this, uh, this development, we hope to be catalytic in nature um, as our vision for this five development parcel is to build more of a campus feel and innovation park on the north side. Um, a lot of this, uh, one of the, some of the things that really are exciting to us is one, um, our creative approach um, from redevelopment um, in terms of looking at job creation and looking at some of the removing some of the traditional red tape to get skin in the game from community members to have them chip in with the redevelopment of the space. Um, but also to one of the philosophies uh, that we all embody, which is transfer, transferring ownership back. Um, we know that 
you know, there's five parcels here and we're looking to take partnerships with uh, other businesses and other folks who have similar values and, and, and philosophies around that. Um, and we're really excited around the programming and activation of the space. Really our goal with these five parcels is to build an ecosystem, um, somewhat a one-stop shop in nature that uh, focuses on entrepreneurship, um, programming, and different types of workshops to the community. Um, so again, we're really excited for this opportunity and, and thank you guys again for the consideration. Congratulations to getting to this point. Thanks. It's probably took more to get to this point than it will going forward. <laughs> Lester, did you want to say something also? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, it is an, indeed a privilege and honor to be here amongst you guys. Uh, I, I'm actually, it was kind of funny because I was sitting here and I, I didn't realize we're last on the list, but nevertheless, the, uh, last for last. the Urban well, League. Last too. Yes. Okay. But the Urban League was actually honored today, and I, I'm actually a byproduct of the Urban League. Uh, the late uh, Roosevelt Gaines uh, got me my first start in my career as a carpenter. Uh, he got me my first job uh, with Olympic Wall System. I went to him as a, just a young pup, and he got me going as a carpenter in the in the union. And uh, now I'm the proud owner of Tri Construction. Uh, we've been on Broadway for the last, uh, I think, 16 years. Uh, and uh, we've just been a part of a lot of projects uh, out of Minneapolis, the Five Points building we house in the 1200 West Broadway. So to, to get our headquarters to, in such a, a beautiful development, it's a privilege and an honor. I'm a, um, a resident of Los Angeles previously. I went to high school, moved here two weeks after I graduated high school, and Minnesota's been my home forever. So to be a North, North Minneapolis resident and to be a part of such a of greatness, I just want to thank everybody for that opportunity and privilege. So. Uh, it works, so thank you guys for Congratulations your Congratulations to you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. I uh, just want to say it's a busy day for Ward 5, and I appreciate that, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, here in EDRs. And, um, uh, yeah, just want to emphasize, uh, you know, uh, Chris is doing tremendous work in North Minneapolis. Tri Construction has been doing tremendous work in North Minneapolis. Uh, Chris has a building at the edge of the ward, and so, um, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, now you're on West Broadway. I expect you to own something on Glenwood pretty soon. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, just kind of cover, you know, cover the cover this, the length of the ward. Um, but. Uh, uh, it might look like, you know, on paper we're selling this building for a dollar, but the state of disrepair, as I understand it, and what it's going to take to get this building uh, occupied is it, you guys still have millions of dollars to put into this project, and so I, I, I just wanted to name that and um, and say that uh, that you know it's 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 by no means sort of. Uh, a handout or anything, you guys are really going to earn this space, and, and uh, I appreciate all the work that you've put into it. Um, with that, uh, I will move approval of this land sale. On Council Member Allison, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Cunningham. Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I also just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Terrell for all of your work on this, because I know you've put a lot of time into making sure these happen. So thank you so much for all of your time and expertise. And also want to give a shout out to my people for all of the work that y'all are doing. Um, so yes, moving to Broadway, but actually rather Glenwood. Let's actually go back north, maybe 44th, you know, like. Uh, so we're fighting over Chris because he's amazing and does really great work and is very creative. So um, thank you for all the work that you've already done, both of you in, in our community. Community, and um, I really am excited to have both of these opportunities come to the north side. So thank you so much, everyone involved. I think it's really um, meaningful and moving to have these last two projects. This is the last item we take up for the committee for the entire year because mm -hmm. for us, it closes out the enthusiasm that we have and Mr. Trell's work for our passion for doing work on the north side, no matter what ward we represent. Yeah. Did you want to have the final word before we vote? You are welcome to it, given everything you've done. I, thank you, Madam Chair. I had overlooked one staff member that also participated, and I do apologize. Hillary Holmes, uh, our newest project coordinator in business development, did a great deal of the legwork on the land sale documents, and I apologize to you and to her for having not mentioned that before. That's great. Hillary, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, usually our meetings are very happy, upbeat meetings, and, you know, despite a little bump in the road today, it really has been because mm -hmm. this committee is really walking the talk and doing the kind of racial equity work 
um, that everyone talks so much about, we see it through this committee more than anyone else, I think, does, and we get the joy of the success of all of the people who are making this work happen, including our amazing staff and the people who are putting their time and money and long, you know, probably 40 years of working on West Broadway and never giving up and sticking with it and her team and, and these guys who have been so actively involved. So we're just really privileged to be able to call you our partners and we're very lucky to be able to work with you. So on Council Member Ellison's motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Those items are approved and we conclude our meeting. I will call us adjourned.